All right, this is chapter five on risk management, if I can get it to start. Um, kind of an important chapter, and uh, I made you an assignment for this one as well. Okay, so you learn all this stuff here. Um, risk is very important. There's risk in everything we do. Okay. Um, I was eating at Taco Bell on Saturday in Kingfisher, Oklahoma. You don't say Walton's from there? Do y'all know that? Well, I was driving, I was up there, I stopped at Taco Bell, and I got a, a, a burrito. I was driving, and I guess it went down the wrong hole. And I started coughing so bad, I literally had to pull over to the side of the street. And I was coughing, like, for my life depended on it. And if peace finally came out. But, uh... So there's even risk in eating Taco Bell. <laughs> but I'll tell you, the next day, Sunday, I sneezed. I thought I was going to die because every muscle in my body hurt from the coughing so hard. And even this morning, I sneezed once, and I could still feel, oh, man, it's still there. So there's literally risks in everything. There's risks in eating. I also saw a news article yesterday. Uh, it was a sad article about a family who couldn't afford baby formula. So they were watering down the baby's milk. Did anyone see that article? And it killed the baby. I mean, it's a terrible story, but I, I never realized this. But a baby can only take in so much water when it's first born. It does something to the sodium levels in the body of the baby. So they say it's better to make them starve than to give them... I guess they were taking the milk and do 50-50 with water. And it killed the baby. So, it's I mean, there's literally risks in everything. So, uh, so we're going to talk about a whole bunch of... Stuff about risks. An overview is, is know yourself, know the enemy. So let's talk about those two. First of all, do we know ourselves? How many of you really think you know yourself? I bet none of us really know ourselves. Have you actually sat down and thought about the stuff you do, who you are? I mean, it wasn't until my wife was applying for a security clearance that I actually learned. See, my mom died when I was a kid. I thought she died when I was seven. Turns out she actually died when I was nine. All these years, and I'm 54 now, I always thought she died when I was 7, and I didn't even realize that. So until I did some research on myself, I was able to find that. Um, know the enemy. I mean, anyone in here, you know, the largest threat right now is what they call the insider. So there is a good possibility that there's some students at Rose State that are bad guys or are here to defraud the system or do something, Okay. So know the enemy, identify, examine, and understand the threats facing your organization. So do y'all think students could be a threat to an organization? Yeah. Do you think employees could be a threat to an organization? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, lack of knowledge. Like I said, I know I told you all this, but Dr. Britton has got to have some virus because I keep getting emails every now and then from the ex-president wanting me to buy a Viagra. So it's obviously he's got his computer affected with a virus. So it's just crazy. And this is responsible of each community of interest within the organization to manage the risks that they are, as they are encountered. Okay. So the entire risk management process is risk identification. Figure out what the risks are, then assess them, and then control them. Okay. Um, walked into my office this morning. I'm always the absolute first one in the building every morning at like 630. And I, I think we're changing cleaning crews daily or something because every day my trash goes in a new location. I about tripped on it this morning because it was literally right inside my door. It's like, I don't, I don't think they know when they go to dump it, they don't know where it goes. But really, I mean, anything can be a risk. My old office was room 131, and I had two chairs by the doors because we had two desks to sit by them, and Jerry Tittle, an ex-faculty member, she's retired now, tripped on that chair, fell down, and basically broke her elbow, her wrist, her shoulder. She was out for six months. That was just walking into an office. So you never really know. So we're going to talk a whole bunch more about this stuff. Okay. Every mentioned security management and users and information technology all must work together. Okay. We can't. Can you imagine if our IT services was the only ones on campus worried about a threat? Well, they're obviously worried about the information technology aspect, but what about the physical threat? What about, you know, weather? What about all this other stuff? So you know, everyone must need to work together. It says you must come up, you know, evaluating controls. Uh, antivirus. Do I have antivirus installed here? Let's look. Yes, I do. And it's actually doing a scan right now. Great. Why are we scanning right now? 
Can I stop it? No, I can't. Okay. But, so, we have antivirus. Is it good or bad? I mean, you know, has anyone ever used a Kas No, was it Kaspersky, I think it was? Yeah, it was either Kaspersky or Tread Micro. Um, I do, I have done in the past work for a chiropractic lady. It was kind of cool because I wouldn't charge her and she wouldn't charge me. But she had, it was either Kaspersky or Trend Micro or whatever. And it was notorious for popping up and says, your computer is potentially unprotected. Would you like to protect it now? So as a user, what would you say? Yes. yes. Well, the protection blocked all ports, inbound and outbound. Then she called me, can I can't get email? Can't surf the web? Can't do nothing. Yeah, their ultimate protection is to block everything inbound and outbound. So I kept telling her, you got, you just got to say no to that because potentially, you know, potentially can be affected. Yeah, because you got a port open, but you kind of need email port to be open to get email. You kind of need port 80 open to surf the web. And it, you wouldn't believe how many trips out there it took me to you know, finally get her to understand that. Okay, So, you know, it's tough. So it's evaluating the controls, evaluate which controls are cost effective. You know, I'm willing to bet we could probably spend thousands of dollars on antivirus. But is it worth it? You know? Um, yeah, it's, it's, you just don't know. Okay, acquiring and installing the needed controls. Okay? And that's still one thing that bothers me to today. Things are changing so fast. Should I buy it today? Or should I wait a week? Or wait a month? Anyone ever buy anything on Kickstarter? I think I've backed three campaigns. I've never received a single thing yet. They never ship. I think Kickstarter is a fluke. They're, they're, they don't ever produce anything. But uh, supposedly this one latest one, they're actually going to ship. That's what they said. We'll see. But, uh, ensure the controls remain effective. So I install antivirus. A lot of computers, when you buy them, they come with antivirus. Free for 90 days. What happens after 90 days? They want money. They want money or else it just doesn't update anymore. So it's still good. You're just not going to know about any new viruses. So you need to pay for that stuff. You know, there's a lot of stuff like that. Okay. Risk appetite. How much risk are you willing to live with? Okay. I'm assuming we all have car insurance in here. Is anyone willing to admit? I had a student who literally meant, oh, no, dude, I buy it for a month. I register my car, then I get rid of it. I'm like, dude, what kind of car do you drive? I don't ever want to be around you. But... How much risk are you willing to accept? Insurance companies is a way of transferring risk. Okay? And really, the amount, you know, how risky you are is how your payments are based. But it says the, the appetite defines the quantity and nature of the risk organizations are willing to accept as trade offs between perfect security and unlimited accessibility. So, perfect security, I would be turning this computer off, unplugging it, and sticking it in a safe somewhere. Probably in a watertight bag or box or something. But what good is it? I can't use it at that point. You know, Rose State, um, I went on a trip to uh, Washington a few years back, and I, they actually gave me a rental car. First time in history they gave me a rental car. And they said, when you get the rental car, buy all the insurance. Whatever they offer you, it was awesome. I don't know if, the rental, I don't know if you all ever rented a car before. Would you like this? Yes. Would you like this? Yes. Would you like this? Yes. It was awesome. So everything, I mean, the insurance cost way more than the cost of the rental. But the reason is Rose State didn't want me to wreck a car or cause any issues when I'm on business for them. They want it to be done with. So I used to, uh, there's an island called Sardinia in Italy. If you know Italy's like a boot, there's a little island off the tip of it. It's like a rock the boot's kicking. It's now a resort island, by the way. But the military used to be there. Desi Mamano. And I was there like 17 times with the military. But many times there, I'd go rent these little A112 Juniors, kind of like the minis we see now, and I'd buy them with full coverage insurance. I actually got one into the ocean. Because uh, there was a low spot, on, on, low, uh, on low tide, the water was out. So we drove up through it and parked on the beach. But then the water came in. We had to drive through it to get the car. I brought it in once running on a spare. I brought it in once. Well, the windows didn't work. Big old dents in the door. And they were like, what did you do? I'm like, I bought full coverage insurance. It really doesn't matter, does it? So I transferred the risk to them. So, uh, 
But yeah, how much risk are you willing to accept? Okay, um, my wife's going on a trip here, I think next month, and she was thinking about buying insurance. I'm like, you have car insurance. Yeah, but I don't have it for a rental car. Did y'all know your car insurance covers rental car? Did y'all know that? It does. Your car insurance, as long as you have car insurance, that is, is really for you. So if you're driving somebody else's car that doesn't have insurance, well, your insurance covers it. If you're driving a rental car, your insurance covers it. It, it covers you, which is kind of nice. So uh, I keep telling her, you have insurance? Yeah, but just in case, I'm like, if you're going to do just in case when on the trip, why don't you do just in case now and buy better insurance? Because, I mean, it's the same insurance we have now that we use every day. So it says, the reason approach is one to balance the expenses and control vulnerabilities against the potential losses. So I got this remote control. I know I use it in a lot of examples, but what's it going to cost to replace this remote control? What do you think? Like 10, 15, maybe 20 bucks. Okay, maybe 20 bucks. I'm willing to bet I could find a company that would insure this remote control. You know, Beyonce's hair is like insured for $6 million. Okay? So I could probably find someone to insure this remote control. I'm willing to bet it's going to cost more than 20 bucks. So is it worth it? No. Row State, you know, there's a sticker on this computer down there somewhere, maybe, on the front, where they, where they are cataloging this computer. They don't catalog the mouse, the keyboard, that, the monitor, because, you know, it's like, why? They're, they're cheap enough that if they get stolen, we'll just replace it. That doesn't mean you're going to steal them now. Okay. So residual risk is after we've done all we can... So with my car insurance, I've transferred the risk to the insurance company, but there's some residual risk. Okay, I have to pay deductible. Um, kind of a stupid story, but before the holidays, before Christmas, Virginia was driving out in front of Tinker, and some guy swiped her. Some guy from a little town out in the middle of nowhere got lost, exited right out in front of Tinker, and just basically hit her car. I even have it on recording. The guy, yes, totally my fault. I'm guilty. My Blob, I haven't recorded everything. So I contact the insurance company and, um, you know, send them all the information about the wreck. It's going to cost, you know, like 2500 bucks to fix it. A little scratch this big, 2500 bucks. But, and they, and the guy talking on the phone, he's like, well, you know, I have a $900 deductible. So the guy's like, you're going to have to pay the $900 deductible. And I said, but I have a recording from the other guy saying it's his fault. He goes, all right, so as soon as we can get a hold of that guy and his insurance company and they reimburse us, then we'll reimburse you the $900. I says, well, you're his insurance company. They're like, what? I says, yeah. That guy and my wife happen to have the same insurance company, so really it's you. He's like, so you check? Sure enough, he's one of our clients. So no problem, no deductible. So I said, good. The guy's guilty, no deductible. So I went to drop the car off right before the holidays to get fixed because we were going to be gone, and they want to charge me deductible. Seriously? So we called the company again, got it all worked out. Okay, you're right, no deductible. Come back after the holiday, pick up the car. They want to charge me deductible again. I'm like, seriously? We've done this. So we do all the calls again. Oh, you're right, no deductible. So they give me the car. Two weeks later, I get notification that they're sending a check to the place that fixed the car minus the $900 deductible. I'm like, seriously, how many times are we going to talk about this? So they're like, our bad for the 12th time. We're revising it and sending them the check for the entire amount. I says, great. Guess what happened three weeks ago? I got a $900 check in the mail for refund of the deductible that I never paid. I'm just holding it. <laughs> so it's like crazy. I don't know what the deal is. <laughs> this deductible is crazy. I just, I literally got a check in the mail. I'm like, it says, you know, refund of the deductible that I never paid. So I don't know. It's, it's crazy. Just crazy. Uh, Liberty Mutual. I mean, I like the company, but it's like, what the heck? You know, I don't know. It's just, oh well. Got to fix, but okay. Uh, so the goal is to bring residual risk into line with your appetite. How much can you afford? That's where your deductible is. How much deductible can you afford? Okay. All right, that's kind of what we just talked about there, residual risk. Risk identification involves identifying, classifying, and prioritizing your assets. Okay. Obviously, the microphone's an asset. We don't care about it because it's cheap, but it's still an asset. The computer's an asset. The printer's an asset. People are assets. Rose State pays our health insurance. Yeah, they want to keep us healthy. I mean, it's kind of, it's a benefit, but it's also good for them. 
And every year I complete this stupid online health thing, get 250 bucks off my deductible. Because the insurance company realizes, hey, if he answers all these questions about his health, maybe he'll start acting healthier and save us money. And so it's just crazy. Okay. So the assessment process yeah, identifies and quantifies the risk. We're going to talk a whole bunch more about that. Okay. So we're going to plan. So we're going to talk. We're going to start here. We're going to plan and organize the process. Okay. First step is to follow the to follow your project management principles. First, I'm assuming none of you are project management experts in here. But we're going to talk a little bit about that. It says organize a team to do this. Should one person do all this? What do you think? No, unless it's your your own business. It's not a good idea to have one person do anything because you don't. They might miss something. Now, I'm terrible. I, I miss stuff all the time. That's like working on curriculum. I always work with Arlene. That way she can get stuff I miss and vice versa. Okay. So it says. It says, must be planned out, must have periodic deliverables, must have reviews, presentations to management, all that stuff. Tasks, everything must be laid out. Whereas how to do all this stuff. Iterative. Iterative means we're going to keep doing this over and over and over. So by doing all these risks, so we, we go through this entire campus and identify every asset or every risk or every whatever. Are we done when, it's, when we're done? There's, we're always bringing on new assets. There should be something... Every year they come do and do an inventory of, on campus. Every year. When I worked on Tinker, I still remember there was a guy from um, Keesel Air Force Base, or it was it Kelly? One of those, one of the case places, was up here at Tinker doing an inventory of the network. And I said, Guy, we are literally running this wire right now. We'll be done in 30 minutes. He goes, No, this is a snapshot right now. I says, you know, in 30 minutes, it's going to be outdated. He goes, well, there's stuff changing all the time. So he had a valuable point, okay? But, uh, yeah, so it's something that changes all the time, so you have to continually do it, okay? Then we categorize everything. People, you know, procedures, data, all. I mean, can you think of a procedure as something that needs to be? How about the new Coke? You remember when they came out with the new Coke formula and the original Coke formula? All those recipes are... Trade secrets, whatever, they're valuable items as well, okay? Data, software, all those are different things, okay? Data, we got transmission, processing, storage. How is all that managed? You know, our network here is not shielded, twisted pair, so technically it could be captured. The switch is sitting on the open. How do I know one of you didn't, you know, put a little connector on there capturing the data? We don't know, okay? So people, procedures, data, human resources, documentation, data, hard to do, but still needs to be done. Okay, That's why all of our positions here at campus are categorized. We've got a professor, we have administrative assistant, we have vice president of this, we have all that kind of stuff. Okay, For people, the position, the name, who the supervisor are, the security clearance, special skills, all that stuff needs to be tracked down. Okay. I think I added something here. Okay, something called directory information. This wasn't on the original slides. So directory information is the information that colleges are able to release regarding a student unless you require it not to be released. So your name and your major field of study can be released. Uh, a student actually came in this morning. He's like, does Rose say sell my email address? Because I guess all of a sudden he's getting a lot of advertisements from other colleges about four-year schools. I don't know if you guys are getting them yet. Well, it's not that we're selling it. We turn that information over to state regents, and it kind of gets shared amongst schools. Now, obviously, we've got your name. We've got your email. I mean, that's, that's all there is to it, okay? And what your major is. We do that because... Hopefully, you know, if you're a cybersecurity major, you're not going to get bombarded of a law school or a, some other school. Okay, non-directory information. According to FERPA, okay, stuff that can be not given out so without prior written consent of the student, birthday, religious affiliation, and citizenship cannot be given out. So, just kind of, kind of weird. Just stuff we can't give out unless you specifically give us written consent. Now, uh, my grant students, I make them fill out a paper that has birthday, it has citizens, I don't care about their religious prefer preferences, but has their citizenship, has all employment, whether they got kids, 
we need that because it's a grant. And you know, if you're going to give grant money, you have to fill this out because the government wants to know. So basically, by being on the grant, you're allowing that. Okay. Hardware, software, and network. I was in a meeting, and they were talking about how we have um, what's it, SMS. Basically scans the network and keeps track of all the hardware on the network. So I mean, I guess we have 2,500 computers on this campus. I'm like, is that a complete list? Yes. Every network attached computer is on this list. I said, okay. How about my cyber lab? It's on a separate network. Okay, this is every computer except for Ken's cyber lab. What about this other area on campus? Across campus? Oh, and without that too. And without this and without this. And so in other words, you're never going to have a complete list. It would be very hard to do. Okay. Um, attributes to keep. IP address, MAC address, elements, types, serial numbers, manufacturers. Is that too much information to store? How much do you think you should really keep about this computer? Well, I have an example here. I go on a lot of vacations. Okay. I'm assuming some of you have been on vacation before. Do you keep any information about the vacation you went on? Well, here's what I keep. There is all the cruises I've ever taken in my life. I keep the line, the cruise number, when I went, the sailing day, the dates of the cruise, the ship I was on, the booking number, the destination, the room, and day. So do I, am I just a little anal by keeping all that? No. I'd say that might be just keen of it too much, but no, I'd say that's about right. Well, let me tell you my process behind it. First of all, every cruise line has a loyalty program. And I want to make sure I'm getting credit for the right number of cruises. Because Celebrity Cruises lost all my stuff. Somehow in the migration, they lost it all. So I had to buy them information. Huh, I happen to have all that. Um, I have a lot of students who go on and get federal jobs. And I've had a lot of students who go on cruises with me. Then they're like, hey, Ken, do you happen to know which islands we visited? Well, I just so happen to know. We went here, 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 here. See, I don't have everything for way back in the beginning, but I'm trying to keep it all because you wouldn't believe how handy this comes in sometimes. Now I usually use it in class projects. So, the current project in security auditing, by the way, this is posted online. I always ask the students, how many days was I on Carnival? That'll be 111 days. And they're like, how can we figure that out? Well, it's right here. You just have to find this document. So, uh, but comes to the point like how much is too much information to store it's kind of like data mining everything is being stored i don't know if you all are aware of that everything is being stored about everything okay i don't care if you go in walmart everything is being before long you're going to go in with your phone and it's i mean walmart supposedly has this in some stores already where you can put in what you're looking for and it'll literally show you a little map and direct you right to that item on the shelf that will be so sweet because I hate walking up and down. And Oh, yeah, that's over in housewares or it's in automotive. It's like, what? I need a funnel one time. Just a little funnel. Oh, that's over in automotive. I'm like, but I want one for the kitchen. Well, they're all stored in the same place. I'm like, oh, that's stupid. But, you know. So, is it too much information? I don't know. Are also Walmarts, uh, they're already making it to where you can order stuff online or already have like a... A grocery list and stuff online. And then pick, you can have it where you just drive up and pick it up, too. Yeah. I think this one now supports it, doesn't it? I think they do. Yep. Or it will be soon. Yeah. I think it's an awesome. Hey, anything to make it quicker and easier? I mean, Y'all ever been to Five Guys? Yes. Five Guys? You know you can order online with an app. I did it again. I did a mystery shop for them uh, Sunday. Man, they were like to the minute. Because I ordered it, and because I knew it was supposed to take exactly seven minutes. I walked in in about six minutes, told them my name, literally seven minutes. Okay, your order's ready. I'm like, sweet. It was like perfect timing. But everything's going to be that way before long. They're trying to make it more convenient. So, you know, I don't know. It's kind of cool. But so how much is too much to store? Depends on you. I will tell you, since I have to do taxes and everything else, it's always a good idea to keep track of everything. Dr. Shinoy from University of Tulsa was saying, was telling the students that when he went up for a security clearance, he had to tell them information about every single time he was outside the United States. He has 58 trips. Can you imagine? At least now I know where my cruises all went. 
If he had to, if I had to figure out every single time I went outside the United States, let's say it's been seven years in Europe, so I've been, I went all over after that, so it'd be very hard to keep up with. All right. So asset inventory, you know, everything needs to be identified and inventoried. If you don't inventory it, you know, there was a, we had a guy come speak one day. He was, uh, worked at the GM plant when it was the GM plant. Um, he was, when he was first brought on there, he was asked to do an inventory of their resources. So he went into the area where the computers were and says, okay, how many computers do you got? They said, eh, about 100, 110. Okay. How many printers do you got? I don't know. Maybe a dozen. Well, once he did the inventory, he found out there was basically a printer for every single computer. There was pretty much 120 computers and nearly 120 printers. Because they weren't keeping track of any of that stuff. And, you know, I used to take care of a company across town, Chapel Supply. My son takes care of them now. But they literally had a printer on every desk. I'm like, you know, our desks are so close together, we could share a printer. He's like, yeah, but, you know, well, their big deal was, well, if he's printing, and I need to print right now, I don't want to have to wait. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> That's a little excessive. Yeah, it, it, no, it's, it's, it's a waste. You really have to be printing really high volume to justify having a printer for every computer. Yeah, that's exactly like what I told them. printing something pretty much every second of it. Right. Yeah. But that's what they said, uh, and, you know, uh, they paid the bill. Yeah, I was going to say, they were paid whatever. Yeah, they paid for it. <laughs> they were kind of shady anyway, because actually the owner is no longer, okay, the, the, really the, He's no longer the actual official owner, but the father, which was the owner, is no longer allowed to own a business due to tax issues. And I still remember he was like, Ken, I need a, a scanner. Back when scanners were really popular. He goes, I need you to order me two of these scanners. Buy me two of them, but bill me for one. Just make it cost twice as much. Uh, what? So I bought two scanners, billed them for one but the price was twice as much. You know where the other scanner went? To his house. And he would always buy a new computer, then take it home, and then donate his work computer to the business. It was like, I mean, his home computer to the business. It's like, it's very shady, and uh, that's why he's not allowed to own another business. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's tough keeping track of all this inventorying stuff. It, it's just really hard. Okay. Asset categorization, people, says compromise employees and non-employees, procedures, data components, software components. There's so much stuff to categorize. So we had employees here at Rose. We also have hourly workers. They're, ca they're, they're categorized differently. Well, some get benefits, some don't. So there, there's really all kinds of different ways to categorize people. Check out this. McDonald's hires around 1 million workers every year. They estimate the fast food nations consume 700 million domestic workforce with 150% turnover rate. I was told it was 600% turnover rate, but I couldn't find. This is the only actual figure I found. That's 150% turnover. Because I actually did a lot of looking into this this afternoon. And I guess McDonald's is a better benefits package now. You actually get five days vacation a year. And they'll pay for your education. Hey, some kid right out of school, that's pretty darn awesome. Yeah. That hasn't happened yet. yeah. Well, supposedly it's being implemented. Um, but, you know, 150% turnover rate, that's a lot. How much does it cost to train somebody? Yeah. Think it. Yeah. Uh, what, say you're going to work at Tinker. You're going to need a security clearance. You know, those things cost upwards of $100,000 to get a top secret clearance. They're very expensive to do. All right, classifying, value, and prioritizing, you know, confidential, internal, public, where is your data being used? Where is it being stored? What are the computers? It's kind of hard to think about if you've never worked on, like, a military network that has top secret data. That's when you really get to see this stuff. Everything is classified. Y'all know about the whole Hillary Clinton stuff. Just threw that away, but uh, it's a... Uh, when done correctly, it's a lot of work, but it's kind of important stuff to do. Okay. All right. There's a variety of classification schemes. There's the military. There's just tons of them out there. Stick with one and don't change it. 
Like at Rose State, do you think we actually have any top secret data here on campus? No. There's no way. Now, pretty much we're a public school. So if you, so Brendan over there really needed to know some information. He could petition the school with a Freedom of Information Act and get anything he wants because we're a public institution. Do you think he could do that of Tinker? No. Uh, when I worked in Saudi Arabia uh, with the military, well, we, I took two trips over there. Basically, they check everything. When you come into Saudi Arabia, I mean, it is like magazines. They go through everything. Ford. Ford is not allowed in Saudi Arabia. Now, again, this is a few years ago, or like 20 years ago when I was there, but Ford was not allowed in Saudi Arabia. But we had these trucks that pull up to the AWACS planes, the stairs, automatic stairs. They were only made by Ford. So you got a vehicle that's only made by Ford. How do you bring it into Saudi Arabia? Well, you literally file off every single thing that says Ford on it. Even the steering wheel, that middle logo was filed off. They had to remove every notification that it said Ford on it. This guy's Pepsi. Pepsi ain't allowed there either. That shirt could not go to Saudi Arabia. Why? Okay. Like why? Does they give you any reasons? No, it's just something. They do not allow it in there. But the funniest thing was the AWACS has a lot of top secret data in it. It's really the tape, the, the recording system. When the tapes are stored, there's this huge compartment. I've never seen inside of it because I didn't have the clearance to see it. Well, it's funny. Whenever a plane would come from the States, They'd bring in the plane, the plane will be inspected, but not that one compartment. And then shortly after that, there'll be beer, there'll be wine, there'll be all this alcohol and stuff you're not allowed to have there. It was all stored in those containers. That once the customs is done with it, they would open them up and take out everything that they weren't supposed to have over there. So it was, it was pretty funny. But uh, Just a whole bunch of Pepsi. Yeah. <laughs> it was, I don't know, it, it was just, I, I don't know if they still do yeah, that. Yes, but when I was there, it was, I don't know. The, I'll tell you, the best thing when I went to Saudi Arabia was, obviously I was in the military, so I had to wear military uniforms. They're expensive. But whenever you went to Saudi Arabia, you just swap them out whenever you wanted. Old one for a new one. And they were up, upwards of 50 bucks for the pants and 50 bucks for the shirt. Basically 100 bucks for a uniform. So, man, I called my wife and said, you pack a job every piece of uniform you could find and mail it to me. I don't care how ripped they were. It was literally... You give them a pair of pants, any shape, they give you a brand new pair. So I was swapping out all my old clothes and everything. But, but uh, So it's tough keeping track of all this stuff. And classification is a really big issue. Okay. Security clearances says every data user must be assigned an authorization level. Okay. I have capabilities inside of Oasis that you guys don't. Well, it makes sense. But I also have capabilities that Jimmy Scruggs doesn't. Well, it's because I'm the director. I have to be able to see certain grades and enroll people. Other people don't. So, you know. How about the clean desk policy? I would fail that instantly. The clean desk policy is before you go home a day, your desk must be cleared off. It's really important, especially working in a classified data environment. You would hate for a piece of top secret stuff to be left there on your desk. How about going through dumpsters? You know, we've done projects in those. Okay. News article on the 16th, what, six days ago? Six White House staffers lose their jobs after failing FBI background checks. White House terminated employment with six White House staffers Thursday after the aides failed their background checks. So you can ask the question, why did we hire them to begin with then? But you also got to look at it this way. Background checks take a long period of time. And when you get a new president, you really don't have that much time to get everybody cleared and hired and, whoops, sorry, I know we hired you a month ago, but you didn't pass your background check, now you're being fired. So, yeah. So are they needed? Yeah, I say they're needed. Okay. Does anyone here remember InfraGuard? Who's calling me? InfraGuard is an FBI organization, free to join, by the way. And they have conferences and everything else. Uh, me and my wife both applied at the same time. She got accepted a year and a half ago. I still haven't got accepted. And I got an email the other day. I know, we're running behind. We will get your application. It's like, why was my wife accepted a year and a half ago, and I still haven't been accepted yet? It's driving me crazy. Do they know something I don't know? I applied for Global Entry. I don't know if you all know what Global Entry is. You don't know what TSA Pre is? You can pay 85 bucks and get TSA Pre, which means you're pre-screened at the airport. And you go right through that short line every time. 
global entry costs 100 bucks. Includes TSA pre, but also bypass lines at customs. So it costs 100 bucks. So I had to go to Dallas. This is what, six months ago. I had to go to Dallas. Had to bring him a copy of my passport. And I had to answer some questions. Now, I had already done all this online. So I'm sitting there with a little interview guy. It takes 10 minutes. He's like, so, have you ever been committed of any crime whatsoever in your entire life? I said, no. He reads the exact question back to me again. I'm like, uh, is there something you know that I don't know? <laughs> but I said, no. He goes, okay. But it made me wonder, wait a minute, I haven't been proved for Ipecard. Now you're asking me, wasn't I arrested and I didn't know about it or something? Or is there a federal investigation going on? I don't know, but it's stuff. But no, if uh, you guys should look into Ipecard, I-N-F-R-I-G-U-A-R-D. It's really pretty good. All right, um, information, asset valuation. What do things cost? What will be more expensive to replace or protect it? Again, this remote control, probably cheaper just to replace it. But, kind of important we have one as well. So, because of this thing, should I buy extra? Okay. The Marine guy, we used to take care of his network. I talked him into buying extra network switches. Because they go out. And one went out one day. Thank God we had a spare. But he actually had three switches in his network. And he's like, wow, I'm thrilled to death we had the spare. But what if two had gone out? Like, okay, we should have should we have two spares, three spares, six spares? It comes to a point where you what do you keep spare? Do you keep everything spare? That's stupid. So yeah. All right. So yeah, what's stuff valued at? Here's an example. Okay. So this document is classified as confidential. Impact on profit profitability. Everything really needs to go to profit. If you're not making any money on it, why do it? We used to have a game design program here. Wasn't producing enough majors, so we got rid of it. We had a webmaster program here. Again, wasn't producing enough majors, so we got rid of it. If we're not producing, basically the regions are like, hey, if you only got five graduates in five years, that's probably not good enough. So if we don't just close it, they'll close it on us. So you got to identify all that stuff. So this is... Create weighting of each category based on the answers to questions. You know, do we need this? Do we, you know, what's the value? And other people, you know, might do it differently. Prioritize them. List the assets in order. Okay, so here's some examples. Impact to revenue. Impact to profitability. Impact to the public image. Public image important? What happened to uh, TJ Maxx when they had a data breach? Wendy's had one recently. I, I will be getting a... Uh, a uh, what you call it a new card email because I know because I use Wendy's and my location was one of the locations involved the one I go to right by my house so one of these days I'll be getting another credit card email I know I will because it's going to happen but a uh, public image is a big deal okay all right um, threat assessment which threat prevents dangers to assets is there any possibility we could get a virus uh, yes. Any chance we could get other stuff? Uh, yes. Right. Which was the most danger of the information? Which is so? Why do we need backups? Are backups important? Well, if this computer dies today, do I really need a backup? It? No. There's really nothing on there. Okay. I couldn't just put it back on. But our data center probably important to have a backup there. I have a backup at my house. I have a backup of my computer, in my office. Okay. Uh, how much would it cost to recover from a successful attack? So some of Formats my hard drive or deletes my data. How much time would it take to recover it? Okay. Which threat requires the greatest expenditure to prevent? Okay. So we literally could rebuild this whole entire building. Okay, we just did. We just rebuilt the library. It's supposed to be opening in April now. That's the word. Is the library a tornado shelter? I don't know that answer. But you think since they just rebuilt the whole darn library, they should have made it into a tornado shelter. I know that the PTEC building has one room that is a tornado shelter. Because I saw when they were building it, it was like super heavy duty lined. So, a lot of stuff involved there. Okay, threats, uh, piracy, copyright infringement, you know, forces of nature, fires, floods, earthquakes. You know, for the longest time, we didn't have to worry about earthquakes in Oklahoma. Now we're having more than anybody. Okay, software attacks, virus, worms, yeah, equipment failure. Theft, illegal confiscation, or 
People stealing stuff. Yeah, all those are different threats. Okay. Um, asset vulnerabilities. And we're gonna. We don't want. I don't have that much time left. Um, human failure. Is that a threat? Human error. Yeah. Obviously. Software tax. Definitely. Especially. Okay. I know one of you got this call. The call starts off with hello. Hello. Oh, sorry. I was having a problem with my headset. Yeah, I got this, that twice. Yeah, you got that one. You got to get, you're going to get it. That's one of the newest threats. You know what's happening? Because she says, can you hear me now? And then you answer yes. They're capturing your word yes. Yep, they're gonna, they're storing that so later on, would you like to transfer money? Yes. They're going to be using it. They don't say the word yes. Mm -hmm. And that's the same exact recording. Oh, sorry, I'm having a problem with my headset. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> oh, shit. So, yeah. So one, only one of you had that? Just do it again. Yeah, I've, it was funny. Cameron had the other day. Then I got it twice, like once this weekend and once during the middle of last week. I just think they're hilarious. I always say, maybe. I didn't hear you. What did you say? Maybe. And <laughs> it doesn't work. I just love messing with those guys. There's actually a recording on my... Uh, Facebook page of, you know, the IRS scam that happened recently. Did I tell you all about that one? Where they call you and say, hey, you know, you're going to be arrested. Yeah. I, I had him on the phone for like 45 minutes. That was awesome. I, I have a question because I got one of them calls the other day, and I was like real tired. I got home from work and everything, and I got this call, and I, I answered with yes straight away. Now, do they record the yes after they ask you or right when the call starts? I don't know exactly. Them? I'm a little bit scared. I can't check in my bank account now. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, if you're every word, you can always get a new bank account. And you can always even get a new bank account and have your money, like, we're actually going to do this with my mother-in-law's because her account's all screwed up. Get her a new account, but then her deposit will still go to old number, then will be transferred over. Okay. So that way, you know, yeah. Yeah. in other words, you're just getting a new number at the same bank, but the old one will still work for deposits and stuff yeah. like that yeah. until yeah. you can get them changed safe. over. Yeah. But if someone steals your credit card, you're not responsible. Mm. You know, I wouldn't worry about it. I, I wouldn't lose too much sleep over it, but I know I answer the phones all the time. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. it's just not a good thing to do. I haven't heard of anyone actually being taken advantage of for saying yes, but that's what I'm hearing. The, the, this is a big deal. They're recording that yeah. to use yeah. it. It's something. I didn't even know that's possible. Yeah, there's just that's so many things. Possible. Well, people are vulnerable. People want to be nice. And it, what gets me is my my wife won't answer a call. But if she does answer, she has a very hard time hanging up. Hang up. But that's impolite. I don't care. It's a telemarketer. Just hang here. Hit the button. Hang up. You now, but so many people won't, especially older people. They want to be polite. Did y'all see the article about the lady on Google? She would ask a question. Could you please help me find such and such? Thank you. And they're like, ma'am, this is a search engine. You don't have to say thank you and please. And You know, you don't even have to put a question mark in Google. I mean, a lot of people think you have to. No, you don't have to. You can just type a statement and it'll tell you all about it. So, yeah, I just thought that was funny. Three of you got it. That's pretty good. Or four of you. So, all right. Risk assessment evaluates the relative risk of each vulnerability. We kind of talked about that already. Planning it. It says the goal of the point is to create a method for evaluating the risks. Okay. And there's the major stage as we go into the loss frequency, which is the second one. How often is this going to happen? Do you know every item has a mean time to failure? Everything. This remote control, I can guarantee you, they're going to tell you when this button's going to fail. It's going to be, I mean, if you actually got into the documentation of this device, it will tell you when it's going to fail. Because it, they literally have a machine that sits there and presses that button until it fails. As it comes up with the average, oh, whoops, <laughs> exit. <laughs> Where's exit? You got it. Right. Oh, okay, good. But the point is they do, I actually saw a document documentary of it. There was this one, and they're literally going, keep pushing it to get the average time for that item to fail. And hard drive, same thing. They will tell you when's the average time your hard drive will crash. So I'm like, wait a minute. So I'm buying something that you positively are going to tell me it will fail. But if you look at it this way, every single person in this room is going to die. We know it. 
right? No one's going to live forever in here. Every car is going to die sooner or later. Every everything. So why buy one? This phone will die. So why buy it? Well, because we need it in the meantime. So it's kind of one of those things, you know. The lost frequency is how often are we getting stuck with a virus? Everybody in here should get a virus sooner or later in their life. I've got many. Has anyone got multiple viruses in here? I have. I just, a lot of times I do it just to see what they do. I think they're kind of cool. So when I know it's a virus, I'll usually open it up in a virtual machine. That way, so what? Kill it. I don't care. You can't do anything. I can reset it back to nothing. So not a big deal. Okay. So it says assign a numeric value. So you potentially affected you know, 20% of the time or whatever. So you got to come up with some number. Okay. The lost magnitude is, is, is the next step is to determine how much of the information asset could be lost. An event of a, of a flood. Obviously, this building, the bottom floor, will be more successful than the top floor. Well, if the bottom floor floods, we got a problem. But, uh, you know, the library used to flood. That's why on the far side of it, they kind of dug it out. Now it's lower in there because that far side of the library used to flood. I never knew that. When they started working on it, they found it was all rotted out. Even the cement and everything was literally deteriorated because of the water. It's like, wow. All right, so, uh, all right, so let's gonna calculating your risk. The lost frequency times the magnitude. How many times is it gonna happen, and how much is it gonna affect? 100% of our computers, or only 5%, or whatever. So, minus the percent mitigated by current control. So, what are the odds we're gonna get a virus? And okay, we get a virus scanner that's gonna protect us 90% of the time. But even with virus scanner, you know, they, they're only as good as the latest signature. I remember when virus scanners used to only update weekly. Now they're pretty much daily, if I remember it. Pretty much daily now. Okay. Plus an element of uncertainty. So here we go. The probability of a successful attack on an organization, which is the loss frequency, likelihood, attack possible, multiply the um, expected loss plus any other values or variables. Okay, risk acceptability. It says risk threat, the, the associated vulnerabilities that may um, have residual risk. This is create ranking the relative risk level. So now what's going to be left over, okay? The leftover risk. After we do all we can, even though I got full coverage insurance, still got deductible, okay? I got to pay the deductible, okay? Uh, we had power outage in my house Sunday night. I think it was Sunday night. And um, I have a generator, whole home generator. Covers everything, which is not everything. But, like, it doesn't do the range, but it does the microwave. Doesn't do the hot water since I now have an on-demand water heater. But I can live without hot water for a day. But we have a refrigerator in the garage I put out there recently with all this deer meat we got. And I was just getting ready to get up. I'm like, uh-oh, that refrigerator is not on the generator circuit. So before I left the house, I made sure I just ran an extension cord plugged in because I know what's, which outlets are on the generator. So I moved it over to one of the other ones. Now, I could have left it, but it was nearly 100 pounds of deer meat. You know, I don't want to lose that stuff. So, all right. So risk appetite is less than the residual risk. It must look for additional. So, you know, if my deductible is 900 bucks and I can't afford 900 bucks, what do I need to do? I need to somehow make up the difference. Dave Ramsey, a real big financial guy, so, you know, if you don't have enough money to pay the bills, you got a choice. Lower the bills or make more money. I mean, that's really your only two options. Okay. He said when he was broke, he started delivering pizzas. <laughs> so, you know, same with the risks. If you, can't, if you can't handle what's left over, do something to reduce it further. Maybe buy better antivirus or whatever. Okay. The final summarized document is ranked. I'm going to show an example right here. So customer service requests via email, the relative value of 55, the loss magnitude is 11, so now those, which one's more important? That uh, Marine guy I used to take care of, um, when he first started, he had really low online order volume, but it started to massively increase. If his website went offline, who knows how much money he's losing, so he wants to spend a lot more money in that area. Okay, we're not even nearly done, we got to hurry and finish this. Um, it says, identify scenario components, evaluate loss frequency, kind of stuff we talked about. Some of the different controls. Defense against it, antivirus. Okay? Transfer it. Excuse me. Insurance. Mitigation. You know, somehow 
get rid of it some other way. Or just say, excuse me, accept it. Okay? Or terminate, you know what? I cannot afford to protect this remote controlling. We're just going to get rid of remote controls. You can do that. I have smoke detectors in my house. Basically in every single room. They're all wired together. And one of them went off the other day. Well, there was no fire. So obviously that's an issue. So my choice is to get rid of them because obviously they have false alarms every now and then. But I'm just going to call the company and get it replaced. But, you know, it's you know, just stuff to think about. So policies, education and training, different things we can do to fence. To get, tell people don't click on that stupid email. Okay? Transfer, attempt to shift the risk to other people or other organizations. There's always a company out there, like our servers down here are out of warranty. But CDW sells warranties for all technology. So we're going to buy insurance for them again. And they actually have used it and it actually works very well. Mitigate. Reduce the impact of an attack rather than reduce the successful attack itself. So if it happens, you know, what can we do to make it better? Okay. Or accept it. Do nothing. To protect it, just hopefully it doesn't happen. If it does. So I'm not going to lock this remote control up. So if it gets stolen, I guess we'll just have to buy a new one. Okay. Terminate it. Get rid of it. Okay. We're getting close. All right, because I really got to talk about the assignment. Justifying the controls. How much money are you going to spend to protect that remote? Is kind of what they're talking about there. Okay. Cost-benefit analysis. How much money do I want to spend? You know, uh, you're getting ready to put a that Bourne Theater in we've talked about. You really think Midwest City's thinking about, hmm, you know they're going to be giving them a tax break. They're going to have to to get them here. So what's it worth to them? To, I mean, what, I don't know what they're giving them, but can you imagine, like, no sales tax for a year? So, I don't know. They're going to do something with like that. You know they are. Okay? Then implement, monitoring. Once you start doing all this stuff, make sure it's actually working. Okay? Okay. And then you can, you can look over the rest of this because I really got to get on and start talking about your assignment. Uh, best practices and benchmark. And find out what other people are doing. Find another school or another organization that's similar. What are they doing? Most places share, no problem. They're not identical, like it says, but they're going to have a lot of things that are similar. Baseline, you know, a baseline is how is it working before we implemented this control? Or did it change? Okay. Feasibility studies, can you afford to do this? Okay. All right, let's see. Oh, document results. I put that on there. Ain't no one got no time for documentation. We never have time for documentation. I am one of the worst. I'll fix something. And six months later, you're like, you know what? I fixed that six months ago, and I don't remember what the heck I did. I don't know about you guys, but I do that all the time. If you think about it, we really ain't got no time not to document. Because we waste so much time fixing it twice, where if we'd written down what we did one time, I could have done it. Uh, someone has to have that. You ever fix something twice, and you're like, I know I did this already. What did I do last time? If I'd written it down... I would have been better. So. Professor Byers like hammers that into people's head, like document everything, document everything. And you know, I'm I was a. Uh, I'm real big on documenting code when I teach programming. Real big on it. Uh, two examples why there was a news article a few years back about a guy who worked for this company writing software, didn't document anything. When he quit, they sued him, because the work basically became worthless. Went to court, won his entire salary back because the work had to be recompleted. I worked at Tinker in the software development flight for the Armit system, aircraft radar maintenance training set. They hired a contractor to write the software, then the then the it fell through and they basically the contractors stopped working on the project, then the government just bought it, then the government finished it themselves. Well there was one module in this code, it was written in Pascal two eighty six, by the way, a real old language. But there was one module all it said in big letters at the beginning of this, we, all our code was printed out, do not change this in any way. Whenever you change it, it kills the entire system. To the day I left, we still never knew what this module actually did because it had no documentation whatsoever. But if we got rid of it or modified it, it really screwed everything up. So it's like, wow. So it's, I was working on a, we have a, 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 a um, John the Ripper project that Forensics is working on right now this week. Well, we had a piece of Python code that we used to generate the passwords. We actually had it partially documented. Because, I mean, I, I worked on it two years ago. And I was working on it last week, 
two years later, and I was glad I documented some of it, but there was one section that wasn't documented, so I was like, what were we doing here? So I had Roy down there, because Roy actually got the code the first time. We were just, okay, now what was that for? If it was written down. See, while you're writing the code, it's fresh in your brain. Oh, I know what that does. But do you remember it two years ago? You don't. So documentation is such a big deal. I know it drives students crazy, but it is very important. Okay, when I when I had my house built year, back in 2000, I actually ran all the network cables, all the everything. Every room is wired. Per, there's 27 drops in my house, one in every wall in every room. I actually took a picture of all the walls before the sheetrock was put on them, so you can see exact. I mean, there's actually speaker wire in every ceiling. So you could literally, I took pictures before the walls and ceilings are put on, so that later on, okay, so the hole's going to be right there, and cut a hole, sure enough, there's a wire right there. I lost all the pictures. I was so upset, because that was, that would have been awesome. I literally, every wall in every room was photographed, and I lost them all. I couldn't believe it. It was terrible. All right, so that's the end of the chapter. Um, I don't have time to stop the recording and start it again, so I'm going to talk about your assignment. This assignment currently pertains to spring 2017. Okay. All right, I'm providing you with a NIST document, kind of like I did a couple assignments ago. This is NIST 800-30-R1. It's up in the classroom. It's about, come on, you can open. You can do it. All right. And it is called, where's the title of it? Guidance for Conducting Risk Assessments. Imagine that. Did it say that at the top? Oh, it does, right there. Okay. Guide for Conducting Risk Assessments. The, the part I really want you to look at is 2.3.1. I mean, it's not a really big article. I would be thrilled if you guys would just read it all. It's not that long. Okay, it starts here. Gets into Chapter 2. Talks about the risk management process, risk assessment, and then 2.3. They start talking about some of the, the concepts here. So 2.3, 2.3.1 is where your assignment's actually from, these different thread areas. But let's talk about your assignment here. Okay, it says, got a week to do it. Chapter 5 talks about risk. Chapter 2 of the NIST, this document, section 2.1.3, talks about different risk models. They're talking about different risk factors, threats, vulnerabilities, impact, likelihood, and predisposing conditions. I want you to review this in this document. Then examine your life and come up. This is an identify items that fall into these categories listed below. Briefly explain the item and your thought process of how it fits into the factor if you choose. Figure a paragraph for each. So what is the threat that, again, uh, someone breaking in your house? How do you protect against that? Well, I have locks on my doors. I have an alarm system. I make sure the doors are locked before I go to bed. That kind of stuff. What are some of the vulnerabilities? Well, I have windows. Someone can break the windows. You know, that kind of stuff. So I want you to do that. So just spend more than five minutes on this. For each of these threat risk factors here, just give me a couple examples of stuff, how it pertains to your life. Nothing, obviously I won't know for, if it's true or not, but just think of some different things. You know, What's the likelihood of someone breaking into your house? At the like, if you tell me there's no likelihood someone's ever going to break into your house, then why do you have doors? Why do you have locks? You know, why do you have, you know, Stephanie, our secretary, forever would never lock her car. Because one day I was going to go, I, I might have told you, one day I walked outside and it was unlocked. She goes, oh yeah, I never lock it. And she gets done the egg, I broke it in again tonight. Why? Because but if I lock it, they'll break the car. If I leave it unlocked, at least they won't break it. Yeah, but they're more likely to just open it if you don't lock it. So... You know, so, but yeah, if you tell me the voter, you know, the, the likelihood of something happening is zero, well, then why have it? Okay. So, you all understand what the assignment is? It's not overly difficult. The drop box is up there. It's due 2 o'clock on next uh, Wednesday. Okay. So you said paragraph for each one of those? Yes. A paragraph for threats, a paragraph for vulnerabilities, a paragraph for likelihood, an impact, so that's one, two, three, four, and a paragraph for pre existing conditions. And each one of these, by the way, are talked about. There's threats, there's uh, vulnerabilities, and predisposition conditions. 
uh, there's likelihood, uh, there's impact. So they read this section, they tell you what each one is so you know, you'll know you get a good understanding of what they are. There's risk in general. Now, I didn't put any, like aggregation, you don't need to do all that, just the five I listed there, okay? So it specifically starts talking about it right here on... Um, Typical risk factors include threats, vulnerabilities, impact, likelihood. They start talking about right there. Whatever page this is, page 17. Okay? Nothing difficult. Read what a threat is. It's a circumstance or event with the potential of adversely impacting organizational operation. Maybe your life is Minecraft. So a threat could be, you know, man, someone might steal my Minecraft machine or something. You know, whatever. Some people, that's their life, so, yeah. That's cults. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're good. You guys are out of here.